How does Matthew recount his own story of joining Jesus? That's what we're going to find out in Matthew 9. All right, so yesterday, I don't know if it was yesterday, but in the last chapter, we had that big, scary pig thing happening. Jesus decides, go back to his town, which is going to be Capernaum. That was a big, scary day. So who wouldn't want to go home after that? I bet you the apostles and the disciples had nightmares for weeks on that one. So a paralyzed man, and we're, we'd hear more about this paralyzed man in other gospel recounts, and we'll find it later on. Matthew is about message. He doesn't go into a lot of detail about what's going on. He doesn't talk about the circumstances as much as other people do. But in this case, some friends brought a paralytic person to Jesus, and he tells him, take heart, your sins are forgiven. Well, the scribes are hanging around. Now, one of the things that's interesting about when you're in the Middle East is these are all usually one or two story houses, and the windows aren't, you know, glass, obviously. So when people walk by, they're like, hey, so, you know, if the scribes are walking by and seeing all of this, everyone is looking. Probably there's always groups of people around Jesus. So then the scribes start thinking to themselves, he is blaspheming. But, you know, Jesus knows your thoughts. And so you got to be careful about that. So he asks them, why do you think evil in your heart? That's ESV. So he asks them, which is easier to forgive sins or to say, rise and walk to a paralytic man? And this is where he calls himself the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Woo. So then he tells the paralytic to get up and pick up your bed and go home. That's exactly what happened. He leaves and people were like, whoa. It says that they were afraid and then they glorified God because who has this kind of authority? I mean, you probably figure at some point they're starting to figure out Jesus is not your normal man. He's said it in so many ways. To indicate who he is, I think they're finally getting the picture. So then Jesus walking around town and sees Matthew sitting in the tax booth. And he comes up to him and says, follow me, just like he did the other disciples. Now, did Matthew come up with a big, long story about has to bury his father or anything like that? Nope. He just got up and walked and started following him. So they all go back to Matthew's house. Dude probably had money because, again, taxpayers made a good amount of money. And in this house, during this time, there were other tax collectors and sinners who came over. I don't know who the sinners were, but these were probably Matthew's work friends, his friends' friends. I mean, no one Jewish or non-sinners were going to be friends with Matthew after he became a tax collector. Any relationship he had with his fellow Jews was going to be destroyed by his occupation. And then when the disciples saw this, because again, those windows were open and you just walked by and you went, Hey, look at all those tax collectors in this house. And there's Jesus sitting with them. And they muttered this to basically in the back. They're probably in like a back of a crowd of people waiting outside of Matthew's house. But Jesus heard it anyway, even though they didn't say it to him. And he said, who needs a doctor? Those people are sick. He tells them to go away and learn what this means. And this is where he quotes from ESV. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners. That's the key point, I think, of why Jesus is here and why Jesus was so agitating to the Pharisees. You would expect that if you had this holy priesthood that was called from God from the very beginning, you know, the descendants of Aaron, the the Levites, the priestly class, all these 1500 years, we've kept all the rules and done all the things you asked us, when God coming back in the form of Messiah or the form of a prophet, you're going to come to us. And instead, he's talking to all the wrong people. And I think, too, we see that as well, that when we see pastors talk to specific people, I was just watching a YouTube video where the guy was getting slammed because he was trying to reach out to someone who needed help and someone who was in a bad situation. Why are you talking to this guy? You say that you're a Christian and yet you're talking to X, Y, and Z. It's what Jesus is doing. He is talking to the people that the highfalutin scribes and scholars would think, don't talk to him. 
talk to us. We're the important people here. But that's who Jesus came. He goes to that town with the pigs. They're Gentiles. He goes to all these places and talks to all these people. They're not the right people. We're the right people. The Pharisees and the scribes and all the temple leadership, they're not going to dig that at all. And I remember once I was in a hospital, I got exposed to tuberculosis, I think, or typhoid or something like that. Because I do work with hospital people and I go to hospitals all the time for parts of my job. I go, that's the problem with hospitals. So many sick people. You get exposed to everything, you know, when you're a part of that. But that's exactly where people are supposed to go when you're sick. And that's where the metaphysically sick and the spiritually sick are coming to Jesus. He is their doctor. And there is no well. We're all sick. We're all in need of Jesus. But he's bringing that point. Who needs him the most? So then a disciple of John the Baptist said, and keep in mind, the disciples of John were strict. This was, again, the old covenant people, the people who were the ties between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Boy, this just even proves it more that this was a clash between the Testaments. But he asked, why don't your disciples fast like we do, like the scribes and the Pharisees do? I mean, one thought is Jesus just told him to keep it private. So it's possible they're not making a big deal about it. But Jesus stands up for him and says, this is a time to rejoice. I am with you. God is with you. There is no need for this kind of solemn practice. When you have wedding guests and the groom is with them, that's a time for celebration. Someday when the groom is taken away, then you can go back and fast. You can lament because that time will come. And he says something about an unshrunk cloth of an old garment. So unshrunk, you know, if you've ever sewn, I've done some sewing in my life. Whenever you sew and you buy fabric, you shrink it, you pre-shrink it. So then when you make like a shirt or something out of it, it'll shrink and it doesn't get all weird and twisted and it pulls in strange directions once it's made into a shirt or part of another type of clothing. Likewise, he says, you won't take new wine and put it in old wineskins. Have you ever had leather? Th- I have a pair of leather gloves and they got wet and they become brittle and hard. You can't even move the fingers in them anymore. Same thing with wineskins. Once they've been used, they also get that way. And so they're, if you fill it with wine, you're going to start to ferment and the whole thing will burst again. I mean, the whole point of it is that this is a new time. We're not going to take fresh new things fresh new faith and put them in old things, you know. And so he's telling them maybe once these disciples start to ferment, they won't fit into their old lives again. So then girl has died and this ruler comes in, kneels before Jesus, sign of faith, and says his daughter dies. Please lay your hands on her and heal her. So Jesus gets up and goes with the disciples and Meanwhile, while he's walking, again, that whole concept of interruptions, you think that all these people are interrupting Jesus. But instead, he knows the plan. He has everyone on his schedule. This woman touches the fringe of his garment, thinking, if I could just even touch this part of it, don't you just imagine her desperate and on the ground? And if she tried to reach out to him, the Pharisees would have flipped out for touching an unclean woman. That didn't fix her. He says, Quote, take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. I mean, it takes something that I'm going to crawl out. She had been suffering for 12 years. These types of things probably had no cures at that time. It also made her unclean, some or all of her life, so that she couldn't even be among the people. And she was desperate. And so just by the fact that she's touching the fringe of his garments, shows a sign of desperation, but she just knew that Jesus would have the power to make her whole. That's amazing. So he, she's healed. They go in and Jesus comes to the house of this young ruler where there's flute players. I mean, that's cool. Flute playing? I mean, this guy really was rich. And there was a crowd making a commotion and he tells everyone, go away. She's not dead. She's sleeping. And everyone laughs at him because obviously they knew she was dead. He goes in there. He holds her hand and heals her. That The report went out in the district. There's no report. But meaning the news got out all over the place, the news of what had happened 
starts getting out into the area. But it's interesting in this particular chapter, we talked before where Jesus would say, your faith has made you clean, or he heals people remotely. But in this case, when he saw the paralytic, he told the man to get up and walk. When the woman wanted to be healed, she touched his robe, but then Jesus healed him. In this case, Jesus goes up to the dead girl and holds her hand, which is probably not what a person in the tribe of Levi, who was, again, the priestly class, was supposed to do. He was supposed to touch the dead. But he did it anyway, and she gets up and is healed. Two blind men come to Jesus and beg for mercy. Come, son of David. So he entered a house. A blind man came up to him. And he, Jesus says, do you think I can do this? Are you, do you believe that I can do this? And they said, yes, Lord. Another sign of faith. He touched their eyes. And because of their faith, they were healed. And they were able to see. And he says, that, see that nobody knows about this. But then it says directly, they went out and they spread all the news throughout the district. So all these people, Jesus is saying, don't tell anyone about this. And they're all just going and telling everyone anyway. I mean, who would not tell people about this? This is amazing stuff. So then as they were going away, a demon oppressed man. I don't think that means possessed, but the demons are tormenting, couldn't speak. And so it says this man was brought to Jesus and the demons were cast out. The mute man then was able to speak. Everyone in the crowds were like, whoa, we have never seen anything like this. And then the Pharisees say this very intriguing things. He casts out demons by the prince of demons. He must be the devil or working through the power of the devil because he's casting out demons. That doesn't even make sense. They don't even realize that doesn't make sense. But you have to realize that they probably think they're the kinds of people who are going to cast out demons. They are the representative of God. This must have just taken their egos down to know that he could do it and they could not. So Jesus comes out and this chapter ends in kind of an amazing way. That he went throughout the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues. Boy, that must have just burned some people up to walk up to the altar and start proclaiming, it said, the gospel, the good news about the kingdom and healing diseases and afflictions. When he saw crowds, he had compassion on people. And he says, because they were helpless, like sheep without a shepherd, that shepherds took care of the sheep, watched after them, made sure that they were not harmed. But these were just sheep running around in the countryside. They had nobody. And it says that they were harassed and helpless. These were people who were just, makes me think of the poor in spirit. They were probably just at the end of their ropes. But here's the good thing that he said at the end to his disciples. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Who's going to be these laborers? People are coming from all over the place. Jesus is constantly being swarmed by crowds. They're always there with him. They're always following him around. There's more people than Jesus could possibly get to work with, talk to. There's so many people. So Jesus is saying to the people who are following him, pray to God that there will be people who can harvest, who can bring these people into the fold, who can bring these people in, heal them, talk to them about the message of Jesus. Who could that be? And so these people, if they started praying, they go back to their homes. Jesus says we should pray that there will be harvesters for this harvest. Oh, I guess maybe he was talking about me. Maybe I'm the person he's supposed to. You know, sometimes I think through the process of prayer, we hope to convict God, but instead we are convicting ourselves of what it is that God is asking us to do. We want people to come. And of course, we want more people to come, but I bet you the apostles and the disciples and the people who were praying this prayer probably thought, oh, he means me. So. That is exactly it. And I hope that when we think about that too, we think that when Jesus is looking for laborers, he means us. Someone mentions in this particular um, phrase that in the Greek language, unfortunately, you know, we express in English our emotions with punctuation. Go into the harvest and collect the crop. Go into the harvest and collect the crop. You know, we would do it all through punctuation. Or go into the harvest and collect the crop. 
most languages didn't have punctuation. This is a modern or more modern thing. And so people who know how to read Greek, which is not me, said that this is a very forceful statement, that this would have been, go and find harvesters. So this is a, it's, it's a very forceful term. He said, um, Spurgeon said that this is the same forceful verb that was used when he casts demons out. You go to the harvest. This is it. This is your time. So it's important so that we understand who God is talking to. This, again, is a message for all of us. This is just a message for the people who are standing there being his disciples. Woo! All right. So let's see some more things about the chapter. This took place shortly after the Sermon on the Mount. This takes place in Capernaum. He's walking in this chapter. And in this particular chapter, we, of course, have Jesus, the disciples, the paralytic, and his friends. We have Matthew, who gets called. We have Matthew's buddies, his work friends, the tax collectors, and the sinners who are meeting with Jesus and getting a chance to talk to him. We see that there are Pharisees and scribes in this area. So we know that there were people who were observing all of this that were going on. The girl who was dead, the woman who had the blood disorder, who out of desperation touched the fringes of Jesus' robe. We have the two blind men. We have the man who was unable to speak. And then again, at the end, we have the disciples of Jesus getting one heck of a message in one statement. Isn't it amazing? It's funny to me as I've been doing this podcast that there are times when I'll describe something or I research something and I will read a paragraph about a single verse like this, harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Chapters and books all written about this. And Jesus can say this one sentence or two sentences and just nail it so that you know exactly what it is he means. Just really, honestly, wow. When it comes to concepts in this chapter, more healing. And you're healed because of your faith. People accusing him of being demonic and hanging out with sinners and doing things that he shouldn't be doing, like healing people or touching lepers. A lot of scoffing going on. So major concepts in here, like I said, there's healing. There's questions about fasting and the new wine being in the old wineskins. You want to put it in the fresh wineskins. This is a new covenant, a new time that is coming, a fulfillment of everything that was meant by God's law. And the other major concept we see are people scoffing at Jesus and calling him names. When it comes to literary items inside of this particular chapter, he talks about what is harder, the forgiveness of sins or healing someone. The big one that comes in in this chapter is those who are well don't need a physician and those who are sick do. So he's giving the analogy again of something people will understand so they get it. Jesus comes for the sick, which means all of us. I mean, it's interesting that anyone like the Pharisees or the scribe think that they aren't sick also and wouldn't welcome that. And then the next analogy we get is about the wedding guests and how they have the bridegroom with them. They're all celebrating. They're supposed to enjoy it. But then there will come a time when the bridegroom is taken away. And then there's the idea of the cloth being put into a tear which is just going to rip away again. Jesus takes this analogy of this untrunk cloth and then use it so that you're fixing a patch of cloth or clothing. It's just going to tear again and be made worse again. And then Jesus comes in and talks about the wine, the new wine and the wineskin, another allusion to something that they would understand, something like this does not make sense. But then this last analogy of the harvest is plentiful and the laborers are few. What does that mean? The harvest is the people who are seeking God. There's so many of them, but they are helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Another analogy they would get. But they, in the end, need laborers. And Jesus is telling them, you go and pray about this. And I'm guessing that most of them went home and prayed and realized, oh, they're the laborers. This is their job. What's to say about the nature of God? Again, he looks for faithfulness. He will talk to anybody, sinners, tax collectors, and the prideful, they don't get it. They never get it. 
They just think that they should go on doing the things they've been doing. They're just fine. But the time of harvest is coming and the crowds are so big, we need more people. What does it say about the nature of human beings? It says that, you know, some people came to Jesus in faith and some people came to Jesus with accusations and scorn. Even if they didn't say it, Jesus knew what was in their heart. And it comes out sometimes that people are walking around watching Jesus do these miracle things. And when he says, we need more laborers, do they think of themselves? (laughs) Do we think of ourselves? I don't know. And what is the message that God's trying to tell us? Primarily have faith. Our faith will make us well. But the big message to me is that God has compassion for people without a shepherd, for people who are helpless, for people who are subject to illnesses and demons. And he is telling us as his laborers to also have compassion on people. He cares about us in a way That is unbelievable. And what does he require us to do? I think the big thing he requires us to do, again, is to have faith and become the laborers into this harvest. God wants us included in his miracles, and being a laborer when the harvest is plentiful is part of that miracle. So my meditation today is really going to be about, I think, that harvest and the laborers. So it's one of those things that we still are here to serve God. Whatever we think the harvest is, whatever we think is out there, there are people who need to hear the word of God. God wants us to be the laborers of everyone, that we should be the answer to people's prayer about the laborers in the harvest. This is what gave me the most compassion when I'm thinking about it is that there are so many people that are harassed, he said, and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. We see it every day in the news where people have lost hope. And this is where Jesus' response to it is, the laborers are few. Pray earnestly to the Lord of harvest to send the laborers out into the harvest. That means us. My prayer then is for me to understand what kind of laborer I'm supposed to be, how am I supposed to join this harvest? And to show me these sheep without a shepherd. I'd love to be helpful. I would love to help those who feel helpless. And what I'm going to share with other people is the fact that God does have compassion on the sick, the afflicted, and the people who feel like they have no shepherd. Jesus is their shepherd and the God who has compassion on them. And that we have compassion on them too. That's what I'd like people to know. Again, there's this whole worksheet out there that you're welcome to download. I have the one where it's filled out. Section two is filled out. That's the researchy part of it. And then you can fill out the other sections. All it is is a worksheet there to help you think bigger about it. I cover it in a very light way because this podcast would be really long if I covered it in detail. So please feel free to download either the blank sheet or my filled out sheets. The links are in the show notes. I have an online notebook that has each chapter that we cover, and then you can click on the link and download the podcast. You can download the worksheet, and you have a link to the blog article. All right. Thanks, everyone, for listening, and have a wonderful rest of your day.